Actually, I don't see your hand raised. Uh, however, um, how, however, some mention of that was made last night. Um, I will not repeat to you uh, my response, but let's just simply say it probably won't happen. Okay, uh, Jim Ruxin, July 9th, today, 7.30, guest of honor. What do you have to say? I'm sorry about the switch of programming, but uh, 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 Secrets and Lies was not available easily for everybody to see. So I changed it to this uh, 20 year old, 25 year old uh, Mike Lee movie called, uh, uh, guess, uh, sorry, Anima Egoyan's <clears throat> 12 year old movie called- Okay, uh, let's, let's start again. Okay, hi Jim, what's on for tonight? Guest of Honor. Canadian filmmaker, uh, approaching 50 years old now, uh, quite prolific. Uh, it's about a, it's a father-daughter drama. Each carries secrets that they've carried for years since uh, the mother and the wife passed away. And it's told uh, <clears throat> in flashbacks a lot, but it's pretty clear. And it's all about the guilt we carry with us and the price we pay for being too tough on ourselves. Uh, it's a profoundly tense movie it keeps you on your toes. I don't think there's any confusion if you watch it, but I want to warn people. There are two young blonde men in the film. They are not the same person. It's easy to confuse them. One is the, the uh, son of the music teacher who, who uh, she grew up with and grew up with the son. And the other is one of her students later in life when she's a band leader in a high school. So I, I hope that removes any obstacles from your enjoyment and your, your engagement with the film. It's really a very good film. And the good news is that in two weeks, we will discuss Secrets and Lies. It's also on HBO Plus. But tonight is Guest of Honor. Super. Yeah. What, could you say that again clearly? Tonight please? is Guest of Honor on Amazon Guest, guest, guest of Honor. It's, it, not, it's you at your Seder, Natalie. When you go to your daughter's house, you're the Guest of Honor. Yeah, yeah, but uh, in what station, what streaming, please? Amazon Prime. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Cindy, hi. Good morning. Uh, good Shabbos. Haven't seen you in like, oh, God. Hours. Hours. Um, what's <laughs> up? What's going on? Well, first of all, we have a Sukkot event planned for October 16th, which is in the works at Irma's campus. We have... Finally, um, a Shabbat dinner at Froman's planned for July 22nd, um, and all the sisterhood members from university will be invited. We can't put it in the bulletin because just the only time we could have it is during services, which the clergy frowns, but we wanted to have a Shabbat dinner for those who want, and um, we'll be doing it monthly. And then we have a happy hour in August that will be in the bulletin and all women of WBT will be invited and that will be in Century City. Oh, that sounds like fun. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, uh, we're still kind of summer slow and it's hard with the renovation. Yeah. To get by, a the place way, to by the way, you know, if you just slip in a little candle lighting, a little wine blessing, do it quietly. Uh, At Froman's, we do the whole thing. There's no problem. I can't imagine there's a problem. Well, uh, it's, we, we have to be kind of behind the scenes with it, but we, no, we do uh, all the prayers. They lay out a nice table. Susie brings, I should say tchotchkes, right, Susie? No, no. <laughs> you decorate the table. Decorate the table with Jewish folk art. The table is filled with lovely mementos from Jerusalem, all over Israel. We have challah, we have wine, we do. We light the candles in the restaurant. That, that's great. That 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 is great. Thank you very much. And I should note, Susie's the chair of that event. Okay, but they Ooh. are tchotchkes. Okay, <laughs> uh, so that takes care of that. Any other calendar announcements from anybody? Calendar announcements? Uh, if not checking in, um, 
anything going on? Hi, Mara and Harf. Saw you last night. Uh, anything else going on? Anything on the calendar? Marina. Um, my friend's uh, daughter is missing. Um, I'm asking for, for a communal prayer for her safe return. It's a distressing news that we got on Friday. She was last seen on Thursday. She's uh, about 26 years old, a young woman, um, PhD student at USC, and uh, oh. it's, it's, it's horrible news. So I, I am just asking for, for support and prayer from, from everybody. Anna Pushkin. Oh. It's terribly sad, and uh, we join in prayer for Anna and for her parents to be strong in this period, and God willing, Anna will turn up <laughs> safe and well, safe and well. Thank you for sharing that, Marina, uh, and keep us informed, okay? Um, any anything else? Anything else? All right, we're gonna we're gonna be moving on. Uh, Actually, I've been spending a lot Hi, of this is time. Effie. Pardon? Should we meet? Uh, should we, should, doesn't speak. Okay, we're not hearing you. You're breaking uh, F, up, or else my uh, hearing is breaking up. Effie, can you try again? Hmm. Reboot. He's, He's muted on, now. He's on mute. Okay. Effie, can you unmute? Uh, all right, all right, he's having a little bit of little bit of trouble there. Uh, we'll get back to it. Anyway, I was saying that I've spent a lot of time with this particular Cedra um, because we actually did it last week um, and didn't really mean to, but we did. Uh, and then Thursday night, I did the, the Cedra, and I looked at it this morning. I said, you know, like, David's, come on, you got to think of some new stuff. Uh, and, and I'm really, really pleased uh, that Tamara, who has sent in a letter of apology, she's reading Torah this morning. She had to make a choice, and it was a poor choice. Um, but Tamara, in the middle of the week, sent me an article and the article is actually a serious article and it's entitled soap making s-o-a-p soap making uh and the article goes like this several details in the red heifer text suggest a practical explanation for its requirements this symbolic cleansing ritual may be built on a physical cleansing procedure using, here it comes, an ancient formula for making soap. And I'm going to read just another couple lines and then stop. The principal ingredients in soap are fat or oil, a fat or oil from either plant or animal sources, and an alkali. An alkali can be prepared by burning plants containing sodium and potassium. Mixing the ashes with water. The ash contains lime, da, 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 da. The soda, ash, and potash dissolve in the water, forming an alkaline solution, da, 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 creating lye. Different plants go in, and the total solution can be used as a cleansing agent, but really like baking soda. And combined with fat, it produces a crude soap. So, the purpose of the article is that in reading about the, bird, the red heifer and not being able to understand all the ingredients that were burnt and then turning the heifer into ashes and then putting the ashes into the water and sprinkling the, the water ash mixture on someone who has been near a dead person, this removes the tuma. And the article says, if you take all the ingredients that were burned, put them together, mix, you know, um, you end up with crude soap. And he then went on to show that in the ancient Middle East, there are in fact recipes for crude soap. 
And last night, Susan Nannis told a really great midrash about uh, a Hasidic rabbi uh, being asked by a non-believer as to what purpose Torah is. And it ends up in the same way. Like soap needs to be used to clean you. It can't just sit there. Torah must be used to elevate you. But in any event, in case you're interested in why some of the stuff went on in the red heifer, that's what it is. It is possible that the procedures dictated for the burning and preparation of the solution could be a recipe for soap. I'm going to move on from that brilliant insight. Uh, it is kind of like, okay. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of jumping because I took to myself the privilege of saying, I want to hit some things that really interest me. So let's look at Plout 1025, Numbers 19, verse 11. So 925. Um, uh, right. And we are at Numbers 19, verse 11, are we? Uh, what am I looking at here? Oh, verse 13. Oh, well, okay, we've got to do this carefully. Um, okay. It's amazing that 925 doesn't look like 1025. Being blind is so much fun. Okay, now here we go. Here Women's Commentary. Okay. Uh, let's see. In the WRJ, to get to Numbers 1911, 19... 920. I was going to say that, 920. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Now, there's some things here that are interesting. Look at verse 11, 1. 11, 1. Those who touch the corpse of any human being shall be impure for seven days. Full stop. What is also interesting being taught here that is not explicit, but what's interesting in this verse? Bad time for Shelly to show up. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, what's, what's interesting here? There shall anyone who touches the corpse of any human being shall be impure for seven days. Please, Donna. Well, it's interesting that it's any human being. So in other words, we're all equal. It's not, oh, if you touch a priest, that's no good. Or if you touch, it's just as bad to touch a priest's dead body as a whatever. I told you. Street cleaners. Did I ever say to you, Donna, that we should get you ordained? Did I? Ever, oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> no, no, I, I just was, wanted to remind myself. Okay. Yes. Uh, fine. Kevin? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I, I guess there's a question as to how these people were dying in the middle of the desert, you know, whether or not they were contaminated with, you know, some type of a disease that we don't know about and people were dying because uh, they were within that vicinity. Yeah, that's good, Kevin. You know, it's always touchy here because they did not know germ theory. And, and we have to really like put ourselves back there, what we consider to be automatic and obvious to them, not so much. Nevertheless, yeah, so people were dying. You say you'd, you'd walk into a house, I mean, there, there are, uh, yeah, Eric Weiss says public health, no antibiotics, absolutely true. But there's a simple thing in the text mentioned here. If any person dies impure, you're impure for seven days. It means excluding animals. Oh. Oh, that was a bitter groan. Uh, yeah, excluding animals. In other words, the text is making very clear to the farmer, uh, to whatever, 
that if you're near a dead animal, you are not contaminated. Only contamination can be from a human being. So if, you're, if you have an animal that dies or you're a butcher of animals or whatever it is, being near a dead animal is not the same thing as being near a human being. Very simple thing. Rashi points out dead animals do not convey tuma, impurity. Then the rabbis go on and ask, a wartime problem. What if you're in a situation in which you come upon a large amount of blood, but the body is no longer there? Okay, this is a wartime, not so rare. And the answer they give is, if the blood represents perhaps a quarter of what is normal in the human being, you are rendered impure by the presence of the blood. Why is that interesting? You live by your blood. The blood is the essence of the human body, the soul, everything connected to the blood. And you understand, we've, we've talked before about this, if, God forbid, there's just too much of this, but God forbid, uh, a person is shot and dies from the wound, they have, I think the technical term, I love this word, exsanguinated. You can also say bled out. Uh, if, if they bled out oh. on clothing from that wound, the clothing has to be buried with the person. You can't throw away the blood of death. And so the clothing has to be buried with the person in the grave, the whole business. And remember, only if the person doesn't die immediately but lingers for a few days, then the clothing can be thrown away. If the person dies, you just bury the individual. But the rabbis are really into, uh, okay, new plow to 1025. Uh, thank you, Donna. The if if um, if you don't have the body, but there is a large amount of blood, you are thereby rendered impure. Blood is life. Um, there's something else the rabbis look at here. And by the way, pop in with a question. But there's something else. Uh, yeah. Well, Eric, they didn't have DNA in the good old days. I mean, there was DNA. They just didn't know it existed. Um, okay. You see the ritual, starting verse 14 and following. Everything must be done for the ritual to be successful. Let me put that into English. The para duma, the red heifer, burning the ash, creating the liquid concoction, and then, and then sprinkling it on the person. Every step of that must be followed. If one step is omitted, nothing works. This reminded me of what? If you don't do every step, it doesn't work. What are we missing? Cooking, baking. Ah, I don't have any baking soda. Forget that. We'll just go ahead. Right? No, no, you can't do that. You have to have every element of the recipe before the item is ready. And the same thing with this very complicated ritual. Every element must be there. If it's not there, um, it doesn't work. By the way, I do want, excuse me, you're standing on my chumash. Excuse me. Thank you. Oh, what a beautiful cat. Uh, I, the, the, in verse 15, it's just something that people pick up on mm -hmm. and are not aware of where it comes from. You see this? When you walk into a house where someone has just died and there is open water, open water, 
with no lid on it, that water is impure. You've seen that, God forbid, in, in mourning houses where people will spill out the glass of water near the bedside or just whatever else is around. Water left in the room where a person died gathers tuma and must be thrown out. I have a bunch of hands. I see Merle. Uh, I see Steve. Uh, and uh, did I see Eric? No. Okay. Um, Merle, Steve. So back to the body with the with the, with no body and the, and the thing of blood. How yeah. do you know it was a human being? Yeah, and that's why I use the circumstance of a war. Uh, I mean, you're, okay. you're you're just. I mean, that that's really Merle. You're right, and that's why I said that. Otherwise, I mean, it could have been a cow. Who knows? Or yeah, yeah I love you. <laughs> mostly, unless we're in India, mostly in our cities. We don't encounter a lot of cows. Um, right. But yeah, okay. Yeah, but this is primarily wartime. Otherwise, the, the, the fact doesn't make any difference. Steve. Um, from what you said about now what people do, it sounds like some of this is done now, but it also sounds like some of it is we don't do it because there's no temple. How do you determine what we do and what we don't do? That, that, that's very good and thank you. And frankly, the red heifer process cannot be applied, period, because of the rule that if you can't do it all, it doesn't work. Uh, it, th there is no temple, there is no priest to do the sacrifice. However, I think I mentioned this in previous years, there are some moderately obsessive people, I don't want to judge, who are in the business, uh, okay, I see Cindy's, okay, uh, who, who are in the business of trying to raise pure red heifers in the expectation that the temple will be rebuilt, and then they want to have the red heifers ready to, you know, to, to get us all fixed up. Um, the rules are clear. If the red heifer has a couple of non-red hairs, it's not a red heifer. The red heifer must be absolutely 100% a red heifer. You can't ask Joe McCarthy's question, are you now or have you ever been a red heifer? And the, <laughs> and, and the answer is 100% yes, or it doesn't count, okay? So there are those who want to rebuild the temple and, and I wish them bad luck. Uh, and they are preparing, they are raising heifers and trying to breed them into pure red. Okay, any other questions before we go on? We're just, just you're actually sitting on my notes, okay? Can you, excuse me, I have a problem. I knew you were going to bite me. I knew it. Dogs don't do that. Not to worry. There will not be a heap of blood here. Now, uh, there is a word in here. And I don't know if you can find it. It says, oh, here. Oh, verse 13 on page, still on 1025 in the, in the uh, plout. Okay? Uh, those who touch a corpse, the bottom person who died, who don't purify themselves, defile the tabernacle, that person shall be cut off. Now, remember, technical term, you are all Bible scholars. When the Torah says the punishment is karate, being cut off, what? No, no, it is not slicing the throat, Donna. What is, <laughs> yeah, you want to play stone, scissors, paper? Is that what you want to do? Now, uh, karait is a punishment imposed by God shortening a person's life. That is what karait is. So it says very clearly, if you don't do this, 
and you bring contamination into the tabernacle, that person deserves and will receive a life shortened by God. That's a pretty serious uh, punishment. Wait. Look at the next couple of words. Since the water of lustration was not dashed on them. It refers to the water with the ashes, right? Fine. Excuse me, folks. What the heck is water of lustration? What is that? What is lustration? It's in English, sort of. What is it? What does it mean? Okay. Isn't it kind of fun that when they translate the Hebrew into English, they give us an English word we cannot translate. Um, so I looked up lustration, That's and I found lustration means cleaning or purifying. Here's a do you know. Do you know that in certain Eastern European countries, Lustration committees were created to find and to remove from the political world anyone with ties to the Nazis or to the communists. Oh, my goodness. These were called, I, look, I had to look it up, and this stuff was there, and I, I love it, okay? Now I know. Uh, these committees were called lustration committees. They were cleansing former Nazi-associated or communist-associated people from the governing bodies of the community. Good for them. Well, yeah, well, but it means that's what lustration is. Fine. But then, because I do this, I looked at the Hebrew. Hmm. And it says, he may need Lo Zorekalav. The waters of Nida were not sprinkled on him. Now, the question. I didn't translate the word Nida. A very important word in the Torah and in modern Orthodox life. What is Nida? Okay, Rabbi, I mean, Donna, yes? Donna, Donna Shapiro. Donna isn't, Shapiro. It, isn't it menstruation? Yes, ma'am, it is I menstruation. A Nida, technically, the noun, a Nida, is a menstruating woman. Okay? And there are all kinds of rules and there's a section of the Talmud that is that deals with nida, menstruating women. Now, what is this? That soul shall be cut off from Israel because the waters of nida were not sprinkled on him. What is this? This is a fascinating, weird, always ignored little twitch in the passage. Speaking of, okay, Merle, what 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 do you see here? I'm just I, what Donna what what Donna just said. It just brought back to me the you menstruate you you're not pure for seven days and you're supposed to go to the mikvah. So is that sprinkled water, whatever, perhaps what might be the mikvah and That's, that that being the pure the route to purification that is great and we're going to go to howard then i'm going to comment on it howard could it be that um in this case means impurity rather than more specific kind of impurity that's what i wanted to check out but the word nida is used a lot past and present. And it is not used to refer to other kinds of impurity. A nida, the noun, a nida, is 
a menstruating woman with all of the impurities appertaining thereunto. Okay, now, uh, I think that what Merle said, Donna's question and Howard too, what we're looking at is a strange overlap between contamination by being in proximity to a dead body and contamination by menstruating. See if you can draw any pleasant or unpleasant connections between that. I, I, I must say to you, okay, uh, I have been studying Torah since I was eight, and that's more than 50 years ago. The, uh, I've never pushed against these words. And doing it is fascinating. Steve. Yeah. Well, this might the pro-life people might like this, but in a sense, the menstruation is the expulsion of what could have been a life. That's what I was going to say. Whether it helps the pro-lifers or not, we have to look at what's written. And Steve, that, that's a possibility. Harriet. Okay, Natalie. Natalie. Um, Steve took the words out of my mouth. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Every time a woman menstruates, it means that she is not. She has not been able to give birth to a new child. To conceive, yeah. To conceive. To conceive it. A new child. I'm going to go back to something, but any other comment? This is so good. Blood is life. And the menstruating woman is frightening and isolated and all kinds of almost penalties for being that because the menstruation is an indication that new life did not happen, right. right? Right. Okay. So Natalie, there. I mean, how? Yes. This is fascinating. So when they say, "Why does the blood scare people?" In ancient times, it scared people because it brought with it the presence right. of death. That's right. I had not gone this route before. The water of lustration, whatever it is, the translation of purifying, but the Hebrew is nida. And the rabbis who read it and the scholars who wrote it knew damn well that when they wrote me nida, the waters of nida, they were talking about a menstruating woman and they're equating the cleansing required for the menstruating woman and the cleansing required for being in the proximity of a corpse. This is good. I mean, I, I'm not, not saying that we should go do it. It's good because it's fascinating. And I get fascinated by all kinds of things. Um, question, Donna, let, let, Lady Donna. Uh, no, sir, I didn't have it. No, Rabbi, I didn't have a question. Okay. I I'll just say hello to you. Hi. Hi there. Okay. So, and we saw each other last night. Eric? <laughs> what? If, if, when, when I saw a Catholic cer ceremony, they, the priest sprinkles something on the audience. You know, I don't understand. I, as I understand, in, in, in Dungeons and Dragons, you have holy water, which you sprinkle on the vampires, and they disappear. That's all I know. But that's in. But I think is that related to the holy water of the Catholic Church that they sprinkle on the people for communion, whatever it means. I don't know. Okay, but you're raising a good overlapping question. Okay, the good overlapping question is the baptismal water. 
in the in the in the that that you baptize people with, for example, the mikvah, the mikvah and the baptismal water are related. The Catholic Church, instead of having a mikvah, they have a bowl. The water is purified and sprinkled. We do immersion, but it's not just us. I, I don't know about full world, but it's all over the world. The idea of rebirth, the water of the mikvah as symbolizing rebirth, the starting again, if the woman had been a menstruating woman, goes into the mikvah, starts again. The baptismal water starting again. It creates a new status of sanctity. All of it is related. Okay. Uh, uh, Natalie, is your hand up, Lou? No, I don't know how to get it off. I'm sorry. Okay, no, no, I can handle that. I can handle that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know. Is anyone else as excited by this as I am? I think that this is a, a wonderful introduction into how the world handles frightening impurities. <laughs> And and uh, Lady Macbeth, what did she try to do? Out, damn spot. Oh, I think she says it twice, isn't it? Out, out, whatever. Out, out, damn spot. Yeah, so cleansing. One of the most important functions of any living religious tradition is to help people cleanse themselves, whether it's from proximity to the dead, menstruation, a variety of other circumstances, a functioning religion must do that. Does that remind you of the power of Yom Kippur? That's what's going on. You walk in there, you walk out of there. It's different now. I saw some hands and then they, okay, Donna. Um, what I find sort of fascinating about all this is here you have the rabbis who spend their lives picking apart every little word in the Torah, and they somehow glossed over this connection. I mean, to menstruation, I find that really bizarre. What is no, that about? I don't think they glossed over it. I think some did. When I, when I went into the rabbinic sources and tried to check Nida and get it directly into menstruating woman, there, there, it wasn't there like that. Yeah, so when point. they read this sentence, why didn't this occur to them to say? I, I know that it occurred to them because Hebrew was their native language and they heard the word Nida and there's no possibility they didn't get it. Uh, I think... I, I've said this so often in, in our little community here. <laughs> if I were back 25 years old, of course I wanted to be a rabbi, but then I'd want to go get a PhD in comparative religion that I never did. And Donna, you know, I think I've even mentioned that to you. The, the, the intersections, even though that's a bad word nowadays, but the intersections of the various religious traditions, many of which have to deal with the very same thing in different settings. Whether, whether you're living in, in Borneo or in Vienna or in, in Bel Air, everybody is dealing with certain existential realities and the religion must deal with those. And in some ways, maybe that troubled the rabbis. I don't know. Okay, when you go looking for exclusive, I don't know. But it's a great question. Anything else before we move on? Uh, you know what? I'm having fun. That's fine. Okay. Uh, by the way, category, if you want to hold on to a category, 
One of the things that the Orthodox most dislike about us is in the category of what is called taharat hamishpacha, taharat hamishpacha, family purity. They believe that, and that it's truth, that the reform movement's pretty much total disregard of family purity is an abomination. And that includes avoiding intercourse with your wife, strictly speaking, must only be with your wife, with your wife during the period of menstruation. That means going to the mikvah. That means if a, if a man has a nocturnal emission, going to the mikvah. There, there are a whole series of purifying events in the category of Taharat mishpacha, and the reform movement doesn't even use the phrase, let alone teach the concept or what's involved. So I needed to say this. I see a hand from Herman. Hi, Herman. Good morning, Rabbi. I have a question for you. Why seven days? If I'm dirty, I wash my hands, I'm clean. Yes. I take a shower, I'm clean. I go to shul to pray, supposedly I'm, my, 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 my soul is clean. Why seven days? Okay, I'm not going to be able to offer you a direct lineage, how we got to seven. Why seven days of creation? Seven. I, I can only fall back on the concept, Herman, that there are in ancient Near Eastern texts from all of the countries in that area, magic numbers. And those magic numbers... 7, 40, those magic numbers are used in all kinds of categories. I know that's not a great answer. Why not be impure six days or two days? Why that? I can tell you this. Washing your hands after you have been in the garden is less of a concern than washing yourself after you have, God forbid, been in the presence of a dead person. There is dirt and there is impurity. And impurity requires a more significant cleansing process because impurity contaminates other things. If I am impure and I go to the temple to bring a sacrifice, I render the altar impure. <coughs> it's a big deal. If I come in sweaty and dirty, okay, people will sneer at me, but I will not have rendered the altar impure. <coughs> Herman, I, I can't do more. Why seven? Why is 40? Moses lived three times 40, 120 years. 40, 40 years wandering in the desert. Why? God, you are good, Rabbi. You're giving me good word pictures. I read a book about the contaminant, the impure drugs from China. If you have the drugs that are impure from China or any other place, they will not work as prescribed. Ain't that something you are just painting Amazing word pictures for me. You know I what I mean? I, Eric, I don't want you to stop. What else is amazing about me? No, 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 no. We, we can. <laughs> okay, but, but thank you. What, no, what, I, what, I appreciate in, it. In that book, <laughs> that, that about the impure drugs and from China, they make mistakes and everything, and the drug won't work at all. And maybe, maybe has its your health, like the heparin drug that I read about, which was impure and caused illnesses and 
other strange reactions from the patient. I'm sorry, this, sorry, but you are painting word pictures for me. I'm a visual thinker. Yep, that's that is great, Eric, and that and that works, and that works, and we are always dealing. Have you ever said, I can't stand being near them? Ever said that? Yes. Think, think about what that means. Okay? We have levels of impurity all through our lives. And I've been doing a lot of work recently on the survival of the synagogue and the survival of religion as we know it. There's a certain element of fundamental natural concerns that religions must address or they become functionally irrelevant. The Hevra Kadisha. Many synagogues have a Hevra Kadisha, a, a burial society that follows rituals of purification after a person dies before they are buried. I wonder if, if Wilshire has that. But in terms of what people need, that's one of the things many people need. How do you go from looking at a deceased loved one, God forbid, at the moment that person is placed in the ground? The Hevra Kadisha offers a pathway from death to burial. And in most of our communities, that pathway is severed. But there are other examples. You know, there, there are people now who are not connected to the original purposes of Jewish ritual. It's our failure, not theirs. Religion must address basic human concerns. And when we don't, why are we surprised that people feel less and less and less connected with religious life? I'm going to go on. We're running out of time. But it's really an important question. Now, we're going to go quickly now to page 1028. Uh, and, and again, forgive me, I don't have all the back and forths uh, on, the, on the, uh, the two books. But, oh, 922 in the WRJ. Look what happens. Let Aaron be gathered to his kin, God says. He is not to enter the land because you, Moses, disobeyed my commandment. You hit the rock. Take Aaron and his son Elazar, bring them to Mount Hor, strip Aaron of his vestments, put them on the son Elazar. There Aaron shall be gathered to the dead. And then at the end of verse 28, and beginning of 29, when Moses and Elazar came down from the mountain, the whole community knew that Aaron had breathed his last and the next part. All the house of Israel bewailed Aaron 30 days. Someone's going to ask, why 30 days? Why not 21 days? Why? It's there. What happens when Aaron dies? Please, Natalie. You're, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. I think the enemy attacks then. 
You got it. The people are vulnerable. But first, they mourn. They mourn for Aaron 30 days. Look at Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Oh, that's on 1026. It's right next door. Wow. Rabbi, may I say something about the seven? Well, let me just finish the point. Israel, Israelites arrived at the wilderness of Tzin on the first new moon. People stayed there. Miriam died and was buried. Next item. Moses, Aaron's sister, and Aaron both die. Is there any difference in how they're recorded? Don, uh, uh, Cindy, yes. They don't mourn Miriam. It's astonishing. Why not? Why didn't they mourn Miriam? Uh, uh, now you're asking. I, uh, <laughs> okay, but there it is. There it is. Aaron gets a 30 day. By the way, Moses will get a 30 day. Miriam gets a mention. Now. Well, what else is new? <laughs> don't surrender. <laughs> the way women are treated has to be changed. Oh, okay. I, I, let's not surrender. Let's, let's move forward. In the WRJ, which, by the way, has a lovely extended section on what I just raised. So if you want to you know, read a little bit as to how they deal with it, because the women who put out and edited and published the women's commentary find this juxtaposition very, very unpleasant. OK, this is like an angry moment. And there's some good writing in here. The WRJ says what you see here is writing based upon the politics of gender. And they, they really, okay, and they go. Now, by the way, they then pause. We have stories about Miriam. And if we had more time, I'd go through the proper way of you tell me, well, go ahead. You tell me, what are some of the stories we have of Miriam? Oh, the water, the water and the angels following her, the well following her. The okay, the well, the, the, the well, the water, go on. When, when she dies, it dries up. Yeah. Yes, that's the well. Yes, that's that one story. What's another story about Miriam in the Torah? Watching Moses go to uh, Egypt, so to speak. Okay, Miriam, Miriam, first of all, the beginning, right? Moses and the, 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 the he, was, he was on a, a catamaran in the Nile and Miriam, whatever, saved him. Now, what else about Miriam? We timbrels. Have, pardon? Timbrels. timbrels. And Sing. the women and with their Sing. timbrels followed Miriam as she sang her song. Yes, timbrels, okay. We got that. And leprosy. One, pardon? Leprosy. Oh. Thank you. And that's that's the other one, Donna, right? When and Aaron and Moses are kind of bad mouthing, Aaron and Miriam are bad mouthing Moses uh, properly. Aaron gets a pass and Miriam gets leprosy, which I think is pretty reasonable. Okay, now uh, the scholars of Bible. Tell us <clears throat> that in the process of editing and creating Torah, there were extended passages about Miriam and her role, and they were edited out by the time the process was concluded. Mm -hmm. I, I got a look from Donna that melted my computer screen. Okay, uh, fine, thank you. Uh, scholars today are looking at the Torah, at these little things. By the way, this short thing on her death is a big key. It's like something's been cut off, okay? It's, you know, if they're going to give Aaron four words, people mourned him 30 days, huh? what would it cost? Okay. 
to say that everything about went on the cutting room floor. Something yes. went on the cutting room floor. What That's when they had when they did the movie of something, you know, that I, I you, got you're, it. you're waiting me, you, you you're you're illustrating good good visual images for me. Thank you. Okay, so here you have finally contemporary scholars saying that, yeah, cutting room floor, there was much more about Miriam and it was not, Miriam was not ignored. She was cut out. That's different than being ignored. When Torah was written, women weren't that important to them. But uh, the, obviously, yes, yes. But don't forget, there were also women priests and 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 sacred vir virgins and all kinds of stuff in other religious traditions. The scholars are saying there came a time, as the Torah was being put together, that the triumvirate, Moses, Aaron, Miriam. <coughs> Was, rever was reduced to a duo. Tell me, where is the story of Miriam, get Miriam getting married? Where is the story of Miriam's children? Mm -hmm. And the scholars today are looking at it and says, wait, this is excision, not a failure to include. Mm. I picked up on this. When did I pick up it? Yesterday. And it is so compelling to me. Mara or Harvey or whoever. Um, so I'm not in any way disagreeing with you in terms of the removal of, of most of the text about Miriam, but I think it's interesting that we're told that she died and was buried there. And then we're immediately told there was no water, implying how important she was to the community. And, and Mara, she was, I, that's the point. The little eruptions that were left show her to be very important. But look at what is missing, an accident? <laughs> and the scholars today are saying, no, excision. I got to move quickly. I knew we'd end up with the good stuff right at the end. Howard, a quickie. Um, does this have to do with also the ex, ex, in addition to the excision of Miriam, the, the fact that archaeological evidence and other evidence says that in the early part of uh, the history of the Jewish people, there, they, they had a lot of worship of God of, of a goddess and had statues in in their house of Asher, Asherot. Why do you ask a question that's going to take a good twenty minutes to deal with? Thank you very much. I'd like to point out that it's ten oh one. Thank you. Um, the I wanted to say the worship of goddesses will never end in the Jewish world so long as sons have mothers. But <laughs> for, forget that I said that. Uh, <sighs> yes, Howard, the worship of the sacred female, which ends up in Judaism being Shekhinah, has always been there. It has been there in the Catholic Church, the worship of Mary, worship of Mary. It is all over the world. And thank God there were men strong enough to drive this underground. No, no, forget that. No, but <laughs> there were always goddesses. Shabbos is a goddess. The Shekhinah, 
in the goddess. And Howard, yes, you're correct. I got to I got to stop there. I mean, it's not a question that is is easy here. Uh, it deserves a lot more a lot more context. Uh, those who have passed away. By the way, this was great. Thank you for letting me do little segments because they they were kind. Of, this was an interesting centric. It really, really is. Those who passed away during the past month, Steve Alexander, Eugene Pantuck, Marcy Segal, Walter Shemist, Rita Weiss. Yard sites that occurred during the past week, Maurice Abemeyer, William Adler, Miriam Arno, Robin Rose Artiaga, Alan Barbacow, Norman Beck, Arnold Beiler, Elihu Bengera, Anat Benishai, Lee Bennett, Eva Bernstein, Ray Budashansky, Glecka Brenner, Albert Berg, David Cantor, Ed Chains, Henrietta Cohn, Louise Creamer, Sheldon Dorf, Maurice Eskowitz, Frida Fine, Beth Lisa Feldman, Shirley Fenton, Ellen Flanagan, Malcolm Fleischer, Theodore Flesch, Dorothy Jean Fox, Blanche Friedman, Henry G. Karen Gerard, Raymond Gertz, Lawrence Gingold, Ida Goldberg, Michael Goldstein, Edward Gottlieb, William Gottschalk, Lillian Grossberg, Max Grossflam, Dora Hoffman, Minna Horowitz, Monroe Eisen, Perry Jacobs, Elizabeth Jacobs, Sion Javahari, Charlotte Josco, Deary Carrots, Meyer Katan, uh, Minnie Kent, Max Kessler, Thomas Klein, Jess Kuden, Alan Kurtzman, Nina Lorova, Zelda Laventer, Suzanne Lax, Peter Leibowitz, Ron Levy, Aileen Lindenbaum, Matatia Malamed, Bernard Melnick, George Milder, Jenny Newland, Suzanne Fine Murphy, Jamshid Nahore, Lil Newman, Steve Pallets, the, uh, Leonard Penn. Gladys Polish, Bess Ratner, Mary Redler, Pamela Resnick, Israel Ritberg, Ralph Rosenbluff, Eric Rothenberg, Dorothy Rubin, Minnie Ruby, Betty Rudolph, or Rich Shermer, Shirley Glassberg Schwartz, Jacob Schwartz, Sherwood Schwartz, Robert Sedway, Alex Schulman, Barbara Siegelman, Robert Siegelman, Roseanne Silverman, Aaron Joshua Simmons, Max Sobel, Ida Sondheimer, Samuel Spalter, Pauline Stark, Janet Steinsafer, Sapir, Stein Sapir, Stanley Talpas, Lester Tarr, Pauline Taylor, Marion Trebatch, uh, Lewis Wallach, Jerry Weintraub, Edward Weiss, Joseph Weiner, Bernard Whitlin, Lynn Wolf, Theodore Zola. I am adding now to those names the list of the following who were killed in mass murder in Highland Park this week. 64-year-old Catherine Goldstein, 35-year-old Irina McCarthy, 37-year-old Kevin McCarthy, 63-year-old Jacqueline Sundheim, 88-year-old Stephen Strauss, 78-year-old Nicholas Toledo Zaragoza, 69-year-old Eduardo Uvaldo. We bear in mind also the names of those who died in defense of the United States and who died in defense of the state of Israel. We mentioned those who died in senseless wars and unrelenting hatred. We mentioned those who have no one to say Kaddish for them. I apologize for those who, whose names I mispronounced and for names I have omitted. If you would like to mention a name now before we join in Kaddish, please feel free to do so now. Jacob Koppel, a Koppel. Nitkadal, Vietkadash, Sameer Mabha. We're on page 294. If you're looking in the uh, 
Mishkan Tfila for Kaddish. Forgive me for interrupting. 294 in the big book, it's 598, but 294 here, we begin again. Yitkadal v'yitkadash. A God who makes peace in the high places. Make peace in our hearts. Make peace in our homes. Make peace in the household of Israel. Make peace among all the families and nations of earth. And let us say. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. This was wonderful. Have Oh, no, thank you. Have, have a great Shabbos, everybody. A great Shabbat shalom. You too. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank shalom. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Keep thank our you. community strong. Bye-bye. Shabbat shalom.